Live from the 607, it's the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour, where we're talking everything going on in the world of sports. Join in the conversation on social media with the hashtag ODPH, because here we go. Welcome to an all-new edition of the ODPH Podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. What is happening, everybody? Thank you so much for joining us this week. My name is Ken M. Joining me in studio, as always, you know him. He's the co-host. His name is Padawan J. Let me talk to you. Yeah. Uh, We are speaking to America. Yes, we are. What a game that was. This weekend. Mm -hmm. Definitely have a lot to talk about because you are tuned into the sports edition of the ODPH, and we definitely want to interact with you. So, Pad, where does everybody go after the show? ODPHpodcast.com. Right on. You swing on over to the website, sign up on all the social media accounts. We don't know what's going to be happening with Twitter slash X. (laughs) Pour one out, folks. Yeah. Again. A lot of rumors. Yeah. So... We don't know where we're going to wind up, but that's how you can keep the conversation going if that, unfortunately, does go down. Mm -hmm. So we have all our links updated. It's right there on the front page. Also, the T Public Store. Shout out to everybody who bought merchandise this weekend. Got a lot of nice notifications about that. People are taking the ODPH swag out into the wild. I love seeing that. So definitely keep that up. And if you want to get some before con season, perfect place to go shop. Also, the Patreon link. Shout out to all our amazing patrons. One tier, $2 a month. Also, the blog section, the classified section where you can find friends of the show, such as 3FM Podcast, Dragon Master Games, Nerd Initiative, and so many more. The directory. Pat, how many providers are we on? 919,000. Sounds about right to me. I never question it. <coughs> also, the music section. Basically, if it's anything and everything, it is the ODPH. You can find it at odphpodcast.com. And always remember on social media to use the hashtag ODPHpod. Kicking off this edition of the show... We are talking sports, and there's one thing that leads off in the fall for us here, and that is the National Football League. It's Locks and Leaps recap time, so Pad, kick us off. Yeah, so we're going to start with one of my locks, and that was the Dallas Cowboys to defeat the New York Jets because, hey, listen, if Aaron Rodgers was in this game, this would been competitive. This has been a little closer, but Aaron Rodgers is not in this game. It was uh, Zach Wilson, so I went, yeah, this is easy for Dallas. And boy, did Dallas win, uh, winning by the final score of 30-10. to uh, Dak Prescott, 31-38 <clears throat> for 255 yards passing, two touchdowns, no interceptions. Zach Wilson, uh, 12 of 27 for 170 yards passing, one touchdown, three interceptions. Tony Pollard led Dallas in rushing with 25 carries, 72 yards, no touchdowns. Zach Wilson led New York in rushing with five carries, 36 yards, no touchdowns. Uh, Garrett Wilson led the Jets in receiving with two catches, 83 yards, one touchdown. And then C.D. Lamb led Dallas in receiving with 11 catches, 143 yards, no touchdowns, was averaging a first down per catch, and at one point I know was like did not have a drop ball. It was mm-hmm. like five for five, six for six or something, and then yeah, you know, he dropped one. How about them, Cowboys? Ooh, Jesus. It is a good debate right now that they are the best defense in all the National Football League. One A, one B. It's in the conversation. You can't deny them. Mm-hmm. Micah Parsons is your MVP if the season ended today. Yeah. Without any question, without yeah. any doubt. Yeah. He is definitely carrying this team on his back. His role players are stepping up, and they're doing what they need to do. Mm -hmm. It does help that on the other side of the ball, you have a team that, in their wildest dreams, would never have thought Aaron Rodgers was going to get hurt after they went all in on him. I mean, let's be honest. Even the prospect of Aaron Rodgers coming there sounds like something you would do in Madden. Mm -hmm. with like, like, Because a lot of people don't choose their favorite teams when they do franchise mode. They pick a random team. I know a guy who is a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, but he's doing a franchise mode with like the Carolina Panthers or something weird like that. So like, somebody might go and choose, like, oh, you know what? I'm going to bring, bring the New York Jets to a Super Bowl in a Madden franchise mode. But, like, the prospect of, like, oh, yeah, I'm going to trade for Aaron Rodgers. The Jets are going to trade for Aaron Rodgers. It sounds like, okay, what did you turn off in Madden to let that happen? To see that actually go down, I know Jets fans had a lot of excitement. Yeah. And rightfully so. Deservedly so. Unfortunately, what happened during week one happened. Yeah. The backup plan is Zach Wilson. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry to say this, Jets fans, your season is done. Yeah, it's not looking good. The biggest telling sign from this game that I took away is you have so much disarray. Mm -hmm. You're really not sure what your identity is. And there is a stat up here that I thought was alarming. Mm -hmm. And that is 16. 
Do you know what that number represents? Uh, two touchdowns and a safety? Nope. Well, in some leagues, maybe. It represents the amount of times there was a rushing attempt, mm. looking at the team stats. Mm. Zach Wilson had five carries. He was your leading rusher. Brees Hall, four carries, nine yards. Dalvin Cook, four carries, seven yards. Mm-hmm. Do we understand what the problem is here? Uh, that's not good. No, it's definitely not good. It's especially not good when your leading rusher is your quarterback. And he's he's a mobile quarterback, but he's not a Lamar Jackson, Kyler Murray. <clears throat> you know, you got to have a QB spy on him mm-hmm. because they're potentially going to break out of the pocket and take off down the field on you. Yeah. No, he definitely is not that. Mm-hmm. And with, you know, Nathaniel Hackett as your offensive coordinator, mm-hmm. if you're only running the ball 16 times in a game. Yeah. And let alone Zach is five. So that means out of those plays of 16, 11 were actually rushing plays. Mm -hmm. You had your QB just decide to go break away and run for his life. That is a telling sign that this team is really going to be struggling. Yeah, and I know some people are kind of looking at what Brees Hall posted on uh, Twitter after the game was over where it was the four football emojis, Mm -hmm. you know, and how, oh, he's he's – Showed his frustration, which, I mean, listen, if I'm, you know, the feature back, because clearly Dalvin ain't the feature back if you look at the first two weeks. Now, could it be they're trying to get him acclimated to the system and get him in, you know, whatever else? Sure. But for right now, Brees Hall is the guy, and he just four carries, you know, for nine yards. You know, now granted, I get he's coming back from an injury, but if that were the case, you wouldn't have him in as many plays as you do. And we have Dalvin Cook you signed. Yeah, he's got, so for through two weeks, Brees Hall's got 14 carries, 136 yards, no touchdowns. And uh, of those 14 carries, four of them were in this game. Mm-hmm. And granted, he had a great game against the Bills. Yeah. Not going to lie about yeah. it. Yeah. He looked great. But the fact that you immediately took the running game out of the equation mm-hmm. and went completely passing, and granted, you did not have that great of a, of a day there, except Garrett Wilson, who's – Proving how great he is going yeah, to be. Yeah. You know, 283 and one, nothing to sneeze about. No. But I think for what you need to be is a balanced offense, we don't have that here. Right. I mean, they have the pieces because get Wilson's good, Lazard's decent, uh, Cobb is okay. Mm-hmm. You know, he's not the Randall Cobb of, of old, but he's, sure. he's okay. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, obviously you have Nicole Hardman Jr. So, like, they've got pieces there, but just Zach Wilson ain't it. No, he's you not. Know, he, like we've said with Daniel Jones and other quarterbacks, did he put up great numbers in college? Yes. But he was playing college where again? BYU. Mm-hmm. What is BYU known for? Some okay basketball stars, I would say, yeah. if you look at the basketball program over the years. But when the last time has you, have you gotten into bowl season, you know, at the end of the year and going, oh, I can't wait to watch BYU in the in the bowl game. Okay, unless you're an alumni or you're a fan of that team, sure. But, like, the rest of us outside of that little circle, no. No, absolutely not. So this is a problem that the Jets are going to have. And for Dallas, I mean, listen, out of the gate, they're looking fantastic. I mean, the only good thing I can say about the Jets is, listen, I'm not trying to give you guys any hope, but Nathaniel Hackett is your offensive coordinator. And I do want to point out, and I can't take credit for this, they brought this up during the game while I was watching. Uh, 2017, Nathaniel Hackett was the offensive coordinator for the Jacksonville Jaguars. Mm-hmm. And why do I bring up the 2017 season? Well, because in the 2017 season, uh, the Jacksonville Jaguars finished with in, uh, with the th- uh, as the number three seed in the AFC conference with a record of ten and six. Only the Pittsburgh Steelers, with a record of thirteen and three, and the New England Patriots, with a record of thirteen and three, were ahead of them. Mm-hmm. Okay, so obviously, with that in mind, the Jacksonville Jaguars made the playoffs. Well, in the playoffs, they beat the number six seeded Buffalo Bills. Sorry, no, sorry, by the final score of ten to three. They then went into Pittsburgh on January 14th, 2018 in the divisional round and beat the Pittsburgh Steelers by the final score of 45 to 42. Uh, They then made it to the AFC championship game where they lost to the Patriots, you know, 20 to 24 to 20. But who was their quarterback in the 2017 season? You might ask Blake Bortles. So, oh, that's right. Nathaniel Hackett has been known to, you know, make some magic and pull a rabbit out of his hat, you know, which. He's got some pieces there. I'm not saying the Jets are going to, but if it happens, I won't be entirely surprised. This is where I put up the Hawkeye meme and say, don't give me hope. 
Because honestly, I think this team is in such disarray. I know players were allegedly posting stuff on social media mm-hmm. or deactivating well, accounts. Sauce Gardner deactivated his account. Yeah, yeah. Brees Hall, I think, threw up four footballs, yeah, and that did. was it. Yeah. So there is a problem on this team, mm-hmm. and especially being one in one. Granted, on paper, the season is not over. No, but clearly this whole team was united around Aaron Rodgers, and Aaron Rodgers seemingly was like the single light in the darkness, Mm -hmm. giving them hope. Yeah. And now that candle has been snuffed out, he's not there. Now, I get he's talking about possibly coming back for playoff time, which is fucking absurd. Yeah, it's crazy, the the rumor about that. If I'm the Jets, I would like, listen, you can try that all you want, but no, Mm -hmm. we've got a major investment with you. You know, but yeah, I mean, clearly the Jets spirit over this is broken, which listen, you're one and one. You're not out of this. Statistically, you're still in this. There's still a good chance. Now, it's not 100 percent chance, Mm -hmm. but there's still a good chance for you to make the playoffs. Yeah, and that's what they should be focusing on. They need to have a team meeting. I mean, Robert Salal has to has to put this team back together. Yeah, because in the course of one week, everything is unraveled. Mm hmm. And they need to fix it. They need to fix it quick. Otherwise, the season is completely lost. Well, I couldn't tell you who the leader in that locker room is right now with Aaron gone. If Aaron's there, obviously it's him. But, like, I'm just looking at the guys and, like, who's the longest tenured guy there? Maybe maybe Zach Wilson? Like, I, I honest, Jets fans, I'm sorry. I, you know, I can't tell you who the longest tenured guy on that team is. But, like, that's who should be the one rallying the troops and, like, you know, all players meeting in the locker room or whatever. And it's mm-hmm. like, hey, we're not out of this. You know, blah, blah, blah. But, like clearly no one wants to take up that role. And that's going to be a problem moving forward for them. Mm-hmm. Unlike Dallas, who, listen, right now they're looking like a well-oiled machine. Yeah, they're jelly. And, and they're rolling. Yeah. Uh, so looking at their next couple of games, uh, this upcoming Sunday they're on the road playing the Arizona Cardinals. Yikes. Mm-hmm. Uh, after that, they're at home against the New England Patriots. And then they're on the road playing the San Francisco 49ers, that one on Sunday Night Football. And then uh, week six, they're on the road playing the Los Angeles Chargers on Monday Night Football. Uh, as for the Jets, well, it might not. It certainly doesn't get any easier for you, uh, because this upcoming Sunday they are at home against the New England Patriots. Then they are at home against the Kansas City Chiefs. Then they're on the road playing the Denver Broncos, and then they're at home playing the Philadelphia Eagles. Yikes! I don't know if the game against the Patriots is now a must-win, but it kind of has that aura around mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Obviously, with this team being in such disarray. If they're going to pull it together, that's the week they're going to do it. Because I don't see them beating Kansas City. No. I sure as hell don't see them beating Philly. No. There's a chance with Denver. There is a chance. You just don't know. Exactly. But at this rate, I don't have any faith in them. No, I don't either. And fans, I know, if they're seeing their players act like this on social media, Mm -hmm. I would not have faith in them as well. It's one thing if it's like partway through the season or in the second half of the season, but this is literally like you're barely out of the starting block. Yeah, this is this is cause for concern. Uh huh. Seriously. Uh, next up is one of my leaps, and I chose the Baltimore Ravens to defeat the Cincinnati Bengals because I couldn't believe this was a, this was a they were underdogs. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Baltimore did win by the final score of twenty seven to twenty four. Lamar Jackson twenty four thirty three for two hundred and thirty seven yards passing, two touchdowns, no interceptions. Uh, Joe Burrow twenty seven of forty one for two hundred and twenty two yards passing, two touchdowns, one interception. Uh, Gus Edwards led Baltimore in rushing with ten carries, sixty two yards, one touchdown. Joe Mixon led Cincinnati in rushing with 13 carries, 59 yards, uh, no touchdowns. T. Higgins led Cincinnati in receiving with eight catches, 89 yards, two touchdowns. And then Nelson Aguilar uh, led Baltimore in receiving with five catches, 63 yards, and only one touchdown. Baltimore is really flying under the radar. Mm -hmm, Which is surprising. It is surprising. But even when we were talking about the playoffs this year in the previous show, Mm -hmm. I don't think we gave them enough credit and I think that now they're really sneaking up on some teams. Mm-hmm. Granted, it's division, so Cincinnati yeah. should should have this date circled whenever yeah. they play them. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, Lamar Jackson's looking great. Yeah. And Zay Flowers might be a surprise, you know, rookie of the year. Zay Flowers is in that conversation. He has looked absolutely lights out. He might be that wide receiver that they've been waiting for. Mm-hmm. And if they can pull that off with him, yeah, that's really, really exceptionally well. Because they need to give Lamar some help. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing we've said for years. Mm -hmm. Lamar's got all the tools. He just doesn't have anybody to throw to. Right. But now with with Zay there, I mean, the sky is the limit. Right. And with Baltimore, they don't need to put up a ton of points to win. No. 
because their defense usually takes over. Granted, it's not the Ray Lewis era no. like we've talked about. No, Ed Reed ain't out there. Right. Thank God. But they're still they're still very good. Yeah. yeah. And then being still very good, they are now really giving teams fits. Mm-hmm. And the biggest question coming out of this game is what happened to the Bengals? And you have to think with Joe Burrow just getting that big monster contract. Right. Okay, he's. I, I don't want to say he's struggling because mm-hmm. two, you know, two twenty two and, and two is not a bad stat line. No, but there's something missing on this team. I think it might be his calf is still barking at him a little mm-hmm. bit. Where you know, you think back to some baseball players, and I know Derek Jeter comes to mind. Where like Derek Jeter in the latter half of his career, latter quarter of his career, had an injury with his. I want to say it was his foot. Mm-hmm. I could be wrong, but he did some. But he kept. He played through it. He didn't miss any time. But he made an adjustment, as all humans do, so that when he performs or when he goes about his daily life, he doesn't feel that pain. Well, right. wh- whatever he did made it so that he wasn't able to hit the ball as well. Mm-hmm. And he wasn't able to perform as well. I can't help but wonder because Joe Burrow did uh, appear- apparently re-aggravate his calf injury during this game with the- reading from uh, his player profile on ESPN.com where it says, quote, Zach Taylor said Monday it's hard to say whether Burrow, calf, will be available versus the Rams on Monday Night Football in Week 3, Ben Baby of ESPN.com reports. So I can't help but wonder is we know he had that calf injury in preseason and it kind of lingered all the way through and they're like, hey, listen, there's no way he's missing Week 1. He's going to play Week 1. And then he played Week 1 and he, let's be honest, he stunk up the joint. Mm -hmm. And he comes back Week 2. And you think, okay, maybe week one, it's a fluke. Maybe he just, you know, there was some trepidation with the injury. He didn't want to re-injure it, whatever else. And then he comes in, he has a decent stat line, but there's still the loss. And there's still, I can't help but wonder if maybe the calf isn't 100%. It's not even 75%. Mm -hmm. And it's holding him back a little bit. It might be the case. And if that is, I'm not sure where Cincinnati is going to go from here. Mm -hmm. Because they need Burrow to win. Yeah, they do. Unfortunately, if he's not there... I'm not saying they're in the same situation as the Jets, but it's going to be a very tough road to the playoffs. What do you mean you don't have any faith in Jake Browning? Exactly. Uh, it's in his first season out of Washington. I mean, he could come in and maybe pull a Brock Purdy. We don't know. But I think the Bengals have to take a look at something. I'd also be a little concerned with Jamar Chase. His numbers seem really down. Yeah, especially for being a true number one and and being the go-to for Burrow. Five catches, uh, 31 yards, no touchdowns. He was targeted eight times. Mm -hmm. But granted, when you have T. Higgins and Tyler Boyd on that team, it does help to pick up a lot of slack. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying he's obviously to blame, but it's just another area to be cautious about Mm -hmm. because he hasn't really taken off like he has the past couple seasons. He's been in the league. Yeah. But is a situation that we knew this was going to be a tough game, and Baltimore, yeah. you know, snuck it out. It's always the AFC North is always tough divisional games because they will punch each other in the mouth. Mm-hmm. And the season is far from done for the Bengals. Yeah, but I think that if Joe Burrow is not a hundred percent, the season can go south very, very quickly. Yeah, no and can. and that's going to be a situation we're going to have to watch as we're moving forward. Right. But in the meantime, Baltimore two and zero on top of the AFC North. Yeah, a good place to be. And their future is looking very, very good yeah. thus far. Yeah, and then the other thing to keep an eye out on is Odell Beckham Jr. because he did have the ankle it's, it's, uh, almost said the mixed up issue and situation. Uh, the ankle situation where, but though he is not expected to miss any time uh, due to the injury, according to Ian Rappaport of mm-hmm. NFL Network. Uh, but again, that's where this is where Zay Flowers may come in, where he'll like, hey, uh, Odell comes to him and says, hey, I'm not 100%. And they're like, oh, that's all right. We can lean on Zay Flowers this week. Mm-hmm. We'll see. Uh, the next couple of games for the Baltimore Ravens, they are at home against the Indianapolis Colts this upcoming Sunday. Then the following week, they travel on the road and play the Cleveland Browns. Back on the road for week five, playing the Pittsburgh Steelers. And then uh, week six, technically a home game, but it's overseas. Uh, They're playing the Tennessee Titans, that one at 9.30 a.m. on the NFL Network. Uh, Then for the Cincinnati Bengals, this upcoming Monday, as I mentioned, uh, they're at home playing the Los Angeles Rams, that one on ESPN. Uh, And then uh, week four, they're on the road playing the Tennessee Titans. Week five, they're on the road playing the Arizona Cardinals. And then week six, they're at home playing the Seattle Seahawks. It's going to be a tough stretch for both teams. Mm -hmm. So we'll kind of have to wait to see how this plays out. But, you know, the AFC North, we do know that that is a very smash mouth division. Yeah, it is. So whoever comes out of there, I mean, obviously is ready to take on whoever's facing them. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to go to... 
uh, my leaps. Mm-hmm. And the first one I had, I am surprised to say this, Pat, because yeah. who is Atlanta? What is Atlanta? Atlanta is a surprise 2-0 and o this season. Yeah. And I did not see this coming because I took the Green Bay Packers. So did I. Because I thought all they needed was love. Mm-hmm. And I also don't trust Atlanta for anything. Yeah. And sure enough, Atlanta decided to prove us wrong. Yeah. Albeit, though, came right down to the wire. Yeah, it did. So let's talk about it. Yeah, so the Atlanta Falcons won by the final score of 25-24 to 24 with a last-minute uh, kick from game-winning kick from their kicker, Young Ho uh, Koo. Uh, But looking at the stats, you had Desmond Ritter go 19 of 32 for 237 yards passing, one touchdown, one interception. Jordan Love, 14 of 25 for 151 yards passing, three touchdowns, no interceptions. A.J. Dillon led Green Bay in rushing with 15 carries, 55 yards, no touchdowns. Bijan Robinson led Atlanta in rushing with 19 carries, 124 yards, and no touchdowns. Uh, Drake London led Atlanta in receiving with six catches, 67 yards, one touchdown. And then uh, Dontavian Wicks led Green Bay in receiving with two catches, 40 yards, one touchdown. I mean, honestly, this game was a very solid one considering both teams' levels. Mm-hmm. I mean, I did not think Atlanta would come out the victor. No. I just, I just think they're still very young. Desmond Ritter played solid. Yeah, no, I mean, he did. I mean, I can't, I can't really fault him on the game. Bijan Robinson might be the real deal. Yeah. Might. Yeah. Still a long ways to go because Atlanta, I want to see what they're doing about week six before I'm ready to say he's officially there. Mm-hmm. But in the opportunities he's been in the game, he has been a deciding factor for Atlanta. So I can't really deny the hype per se, but no. I'm, st- I'm still not 100% sold on him. Uh, through two games, 29 carries, 180 yards, no touchdowns. Mm-hmm. So that ain't bad. No, it's not bad, especially for a team that is really struggling to find an identity mm-hmm. on the offensive side of the ball. I'm sorry, Drake London doesn't scare me at all. And Kyle Pitts, I mean, two catches, 15 yards. Yeah. Ah, that's that's a lot for a former, what, number four pick overall? No, first round pick, yeah. Uh, Johnu Smith, who they got in free agency for or maybe a trade, I forget what, from the New England Patriots had more catches than their first-round draft pick. Yeah, that is... Not a good sign. Not a good sign at all. But they came out and they really put it on in the fourth quarter because I thought how this game was going, the Packers are not that bad either. No. And even for this being a loss, Jordan Love had a solid stat line. I mean, granted, 151 is nothing to really write home about, but three touchdowns is... Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I was looking at this, keeping an eye on the score because I had it as one of my leaps, you know, but I was looking at going in the fourth quarter where it was 24 to 12. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, this is Atlanta, and Green Bay's got the lead. Like, granted, it's not an Aaron Rodgers lock, but, like, Atlanta ain't got shit. Mm -hmm. So to see them... Green Bay falter in the fourth quarter. That was the biggest surprise, I think, of this game. Mm-hmm. I was not expecting Atlanta to do it, but sure enough, I mean, they found a way to pull it off. Yeah, they did. And now they are looking very good in a division, well, everybody has forgotten about, let's be honest. <laughs> that division stinks. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, congratulations, question mark. But, yeah. I, I, but I guess if you're a long-suffering Atlanta Falcons fan, they are giving you some kind of hope. We say that division stinks, and yet I just looked at the standings. Three quarters of that division is undefeated. Right, but... And but, then you got the Panthers. Yeah, well, the Panthers are a whole different ball of wax. But looking at their schedules, though, moving forward? Yeah, so for the Atlanta Falcons, uh, they uh, this upcoming Sunday, they're on the road playing the Detroit Lions. Uh, then after that, they're technically at home playing the Jacksonville Jaguars, but that one is overseas, so that will be at 9.30 a.m. Uh, that one looks like it'll be on ESPN+. Plus. Uh, then for Week 5, they're back home against the Houston Texans. Uh, then they are at home against the Washington Commanders. Mm-hmm. And then, mm-hmm. then looking at the uh, Green Bay Packers... <clears throat> This upcoming Sunday, they are at home against the New Orleans Saints. Uh, then the following week, they're on Thursday Night Football playing the Detroit Lions. So that one will obviously be on Prime, Amazon Prime. Uh, week 5, they are on the road playing the Las Vegas Raiders. That one will be on Monday Night Football. And then uh, they've got a bye week in Week 6. Well, I mean, both teams can only move upward from here. Mm-hmm. But I think for them being both young and in transition, yeah, this was not a bad game at all for either team. No. Just Atlanta happened to sneak a win out. Yeah. Easiest way to describe that. Yeah. And then, obviously, I took your team as the leap, but I think, do you want to go around the league first before we get to it? Yeah, let's go around the league. All right, let's do it. Uh, so, some of the other games we got to mention, uh, obviously, you had the Seattle Seahawks defeat those Detroit Lions by the final score of 37-31. to 31. Well, this game was kind of a surprise. Yeah. Not going to lie. Yeah. 
Seattle, I thought, you know, was going to be a surprise. Like, you know, much we talked about this season. Mm-hmm. But they have really hung in and really made an impression on a team here with the Lions, who I really thought was going to take this one away. Mm-hmm. This is not the Lions of old, but they look very, very solid, and they had a gritty, gritty win to put this away. Albeit, though, Detroit suffering a lot of bad injuries. Yeah, it's so not helping. That's definitely not helping their cause by any means. I know that uh, they had to put uh, C.J. Gardner-Johnson and James Houston both on IR. Hey. That is going to hurt them tremendously. Hey. So it's going to be a situation somebody's got to step up on that defense mm-hmm. because their defense had been playing solid in week one. This was just a bad game with week two, but you can't take anything away from the Seahawks. Seahawks are going to scrap. Well, and especially from uh, the offensive side of the ball, uh, ball security for Detroit. Mm -hmm. Uh, One interception from Jared Goff, and then you had two fumbles, one from David Montgomery, uh, and then the other one from Amon Ra St. Brown, uh, neither of which was recovered. Yeah. Yikes. Yeah, a lot of a lot of question marks right now. Yeah, to say the least. Yep. Uh, then you had the Tennessee Titans beat this the Los Angeles Chargers twenty seven to twenty four. Chargers doing Charger things. Goal, Chargers goal. I mean, seriously, the amount of points that they put up in a game, and you take a look at stat lines, and this team is zero and two. Jesus Christ, uh, Herbert three hundred five and two. Joshua Kelly led them in rushing 13, 13 carries, thirty nine yards, no touchdowns. Uh, Keenan Allen eight. Catches 111 yards, two touchdowns. Mike Williams, eight catches, 83 yards, no touchdowns. Gerald Everett, three catches, 47 yards, no touchdowns. Jesus Christ, how the hell is this team? Well, okay, week one, they went up against the video game. Yeah. Which, I okay, I get, but how do you put up that kind of stats and lose? Exactly. This is the Chargers 101. If yeah. anybody wants to know how why I always call them the most inconsistent team in football, this is it. Yeah. Because they put up these kind of numbers and they find a way to lose. 305, two touchdowns, like I mentioned, no interceptions. Yeah, it's a joke. I'm sorry. No fumbles? Yeah. Like, <laughs> this defies logic. Yeah. I have nothing to describe this team with. Yeah. Oh, they, they perplex me more than any other team in the league, even Atlanta. Mm-hmm. I, I, like, I look at this team like they should be a Super Bowl contender, and now I'm like, how? You would, how? You would think. How does this happen? Especially, I mean... Tennessee did not look great in this game. No, I mean, I'm looking at the stats. Dara, Ryan Tannehill, 2024, 20, 246, and one touchdown. Derrick Henry, 25 carries, 80 yards, one touchdown. So that's not exactly Derrick Henry of old. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then Traylon Burks led Tennessee in receiving three catches, 76 yards, no touchdowns. And in case you're curious, DeAndre Hopkins, four catches, 40 yards, no touchdowns. Yeah. And uh, through two games, he's got 11 catches, 105 yards, and no touchdowns. Well, so he's averaging almost a first down a catch, which is great. It's but- great. But, but you ain't finding the back of that end zone. Yeah. It is it is what it is. We knew that offense was going to be struggling, and even with him there, it's it's not really taken off. Yeah. But they won. They somehow won. Yeah. And that's the easiest way I can put it because I, I have no words for this game. Yeah. Uh, then you had the Tampa Bay Buccaneers defeat the Chicago Bears 27-17. to Yikes, if I'm a Bears fan. Mm-hmm. This, I... It's hard to say exactly where the blame should go. Offensive line I for mean, Chicago. I mean, Fields got sacked six times. Yeah, and that's without no like this box score doesn't show those stats that don't appear with like how many times he was rushed, how many times he was knocked down, like all that other stuff. Mm-hmm. No, Fields is trying to do whatever he can, but I mean, when you have no offensive line, you can only do so much. I mean, DJ Moore had a great game: six catches, 104 yards, no touchdowns. Cole Komet four for 38, no touchdowns. Chase Claypool three for 36 and one. Mm-hmm. You know, so he's getting the ball out, but he's running for his life. Yeah, you can only do so much. On the flip side, Mike Evans have a day. Jesus. Six one seventy one and one. Uh, averaged almost three first downs a catch. Yeah. He was playing lights out on this team. And and I'm sorry, the Bears defense looked absolutely atrocious. Yeah. This entire game. Yeah. So there's nothing really nice to say about them. Baker Mayfield somehow is going back to his college days. Fountain of youth. 317 and one. I mean, Tampa is winning somehow, some way. It's not pretty, but they're getting the job done. Yeah. And if I'm the Bears, especially if I spent all that money on Traymond Evans and upgrading that defense. I have to be sitting there going, what is going on here? Because mm-hmm. the fact that we're losing games in this manner. Yeah. And granted, 10 points, sure, is not a blowout by any means. No. But if you watch that game, it's an ugly loss. Mm-hmm. 
So the Bears need to do some work. Well, they need to get an offensive line, and they need to get a run game, because I'm sorry, none of their run, running backs scare me. They need lots. They need, they need a lot of help. Uh, then you had the Kansas City Chiefs beat the Jacksonville Jaguars 17-9. to Well, this game, Jacksonville showed up for it, mm-hmm. but you can kind of see where they ranked against the top contenders. Mm-hmm. And they got a lot of work, especially late in the game. Yeah. They played very solid – but Mahomes was moving the ball around them late. And when there was a chance to do a drive down the field, they were struggling. They, they really were. Yeah. So it's not all on Trevor Lawrence, I would say. No. But, but their offensive line needs to give him more time. His you know weapons have to get open yeah. so he can throw to them. Yeah. I mean, albeit, though, the one stat line that we do worry about whenever we talk Jacksonville, Christian Kirk, 11 catches, 110 yards. Uh, also, one completion, one pass attempt for negative one yards. He does it all. So, I mean, in this situation, they had the chance to tie and at least hang in there, but they just came up short. Yeah. And I'm, I, I hate saying like they're still a young team, but granted, Doug Peterson just got there. He needs to work with them. Yeah. They have to find a way to to get those extra yards when they need them late. Mm-hmm. And I understand, you know. Kansas City bounced back. Obviously, Chris Jones was with the team this week, so mm-hmm. that was a factor. Travis Kelsey was Kelsey, back. Yeah. But Kansas City didn't look great in this game. Mm-hmm. They did enough to win. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not going to say, oh, it was Kansas City of old and we all should have expected this. But I will say, if you can hold Travis Kelsey to four catches for 26 yards, yeah, you've done a good job on your defense. Yeah. So that's what they did. But unfortunately for Jacksonville, like I said, it came down to late and they just couldn't get the extra points they needed or the extra yards they needed to keep a drive alive. Mm-hmm. They need to work on that moving forward. Uh, then you had the Indianapolis Colts beat to the Houston Texans 31-20. to Well, unfortunately in this game, Anthony Richardson suffered two concussions. Or yeah. I mean he suffered a concussion because he had two t- running touchdowns yep. to kick off this game. They were looking great and, until unfortunately that happened. And then, I mean, obviously Indianapolis is a better team. Hey, listen, they got Minshew Mania. That's all they need. Mm-hmm. And I mean, when he came in, he played adequately. I mean, yeah. 171 and 1 is not a bad stat line by any means. Yeah. But like I say, they came in and they implemented their will on Houston, which we said Houston is going to have a long season. Yeah. Nothing has changed there. Hey, good game from Nico Collins, though. Yeah, seven I will say. Cat, seven catches, 146 yards, one touchdown. Yeah, I mean, C.J. Stroud did what he could do. I mean, granted, throwing for 384 yards and two touchdowns, that's not a bad stat that's line. pretty good. It's good, but... Then again, you know, putting up only 20 points on that, that's not a good sign either. Yeah, that's true. And no word on uh, Anthony Richardson as of yet. He was in uh, the only update from the uh, injury report on ESPN.com is that Anthony Richardson obviously wouldn't return to Sunday's game against the Texans. So nothing yet. So keep an eye out on that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, then you had the San Francisco 49ers beat the L.A. Rams 30-23. to Game was closer than I thought it was going to be, Yeah, to be honest. But the Niners are for real. If anybody had any doubts. What the fuck is wrong with you? I mean, seriously. They played very, very good. Mm-hmm. And they are going to be a threat for anybody as long as everybody stays healthy down the season. Uh, Christian McCaffrey, he looked great. 116 yards, one touchdown running. And even for the wide receiver core for the 49ers, they looked good. They didn't have a great stat line. I mean, Debo Samuel had 6-63, six and 63, mm-hmm. but still nothing super crazy. And I was surprised the Rams had played this well. I mean... Uh, Puka Nakua, mm-hmm. 15 catches, 147 yards. Goddamn. He reminds me of Anquan Bolden when he mm. came in the league out, out of nowhere in Arizona and was yeah. putting up these yards. Yeah. Because, I mean, it's a lot of yards. It's not touchdowns, but he's putting up a lot of yards on the ground. Yeah. And especially for, you know, they're missing Cooper Cup. They need somebody to step up. Yeah. Nakua is doing it. Yeah. So definitely a bright spot for Matthew Stafford and company. But then again, it's, it's a situation of – we still don't know what we're going to get out of the Rams each week. Well, and we don't know who the fuck's going to show up at running back because Cam Akers is absent this game. Yeah. Did not play whatever, not even on the stat line. So I don't know what the hell's the issue. And now it's coming out today uh, as we record, yesterday as we record, uh, that Sean McVay says the Rams are headed towards trading him. Well, I mean, if it's a situation they think he can get some value at this stage, why not? I mean, he's 24, though, which is mind blowing. Right. But there there must be something that they know that they just yeah. is not working out yeah. for, for whatever reason. Yeah. I mean, sometimes this happens in the NFL. 
like I say, if they think they can get some value, and especially it's crazy to think at that age to move somebody like that. Well, we know where the market on running backs has gone this season. Right. So In the pits. Yeah. So it's a situation that if they think they can get some market value and they're going to do it. And like I say, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know what the problem is that, yeah, no, that, that they want to move them, especially for them being so short at running back. Yeah. But if they want to move them for reasons. Yeah. I mean, that's what I said. I mean, maybe they think they know something that we don't. Yeah. But it could be a situation he gets on a, a better system that's for him, yeah. that's suited for him, and he's going to blow up. So yeah. that's what I think is going to happen. Then you had the New York Football Giants defeat, although I use that term with air quotes, uh, the Arizona Cardinals by the final score of 31-28. to 28. Six consecutive quarters scoreless. <laughs> Let's not forget about that, Pat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Six consecutive quarters sco- scoreless. Uh, it was 20 to nothing at halftime. Mm-hmm. But the Giants scrapped... For an ugly win. Very ugly. Arizona, I mean, they had this game. Uh, Yeah, this one was in the bag. And they let it get away. That's the easiest way to describe it. I mean, Saquon Barkley had a great game, albeit though he's injured now. Out for the next three games. Yep, with an ankle injury, but 63 and a a touchdown. That's nothing to sneeze about. Daniel Jones, 59 yards rushing and a touchdown. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, the Giants, I mean, granted, they came back and won, and I guess if you're looking for a bright spot, they have at least one win. Yeah. But then again, it's against Arizona, which, I'm sorry, that was a must win for them. I mean, you're talking about an Arizona Cardinals team that gave up 20 points week one to the Washington Commanders. Bum, 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 bum. And then gave up 31 to the Giants. Yeah. Like, this, you should have pulled up, you know, you should have, the Giants should have pulled off this win easily Mm -hmm. you know because listen i know the giants aren't good and i have them finishing you know probably last place of the uh, nfc east Mm -hmm. but they're not as bad as the arizona cardinals no you know listen daniel jones is better than joshua dobbs Mm -hmm. you know saquon barkley is better than james connor keontae ingram and amari uh di mercado you know and and the receiving core honestly is kind of equal to each other as zach Ertz is the only one that i think is better than the Giants receiving core. Yeah. You know, slightly, not much. But, like, this is still, like, it, again, it's Joshua Dobbs. This isn't Kyler Murray going, shit, DeAndre's down there someplace. Mm-hmm. You know, that that tandem is gone. Yeah. Y- you should have had this in the bag. This this shouldn't have been as close as it is. So, Giants fans, be happy that you won. I'm still concerned. Oh, I'd be concerned. I'd be very, very much concerned, mm-hmm. especially with Barkley out of the lineup next couple weeks. Yeah, you're going to need somebody to step up. Yeah. Because your next leading rusher was Daniel Jones, nine carries, 59 yards. Yeah, and that's and to do that, I'm, I'm sorry. Like, you need Barkley in that offense to be somewhat of a threat, I guess. Mm-hmm. I mean, to put it mildly. Yeah. Because if you don't have him in there, I mean, I like I say, I would be very, very concerned moving forward. Their second string running back is a gentleman by the name of Matt Breida, who did get some time in the game on Sunday, albeit uh, one carry, five yards, no touchdowns. Uh, and then they've also got a third stringer by the name of Gary Brightwell and a fourth stringer by the name of Eric Gray. The question I have here is Breida is not bad. He was a serviceable running back when he was with the 49ers. Mm-hmm. But he's not in every down back. Nope. I mean, albeit they're playing the 49ers at San Francisco this week. So Giants fans, I'd be a little bit concerned <laughs> about uh, this week because it could be a very, very long week. Giants fans, you remember what the 49ers did to the Steelers at home? Yeah. Uh, expect similar. And then their stretch after that is San Francisco. They're at Seattle. Home or or way, I'm sorry, they're home against Seattle yep. on uh, Monday Night Football. Then they have to go to Miami. Then they go to Buffalo. Oh, fuck. And then they're home against the Commanders and Jets. So, Jeez. so, and the Commanders are not bad. So no, let's, let's put it this way. That's divisional. Yeah. This could be a very, very long stretch for those New York football giants. So, uh, we'll see what happens Thursday. That's going to be the big litmus test, if yeah, you will. Yeah. Because if they're going to do anything, they have to keep it within seven yeah. of the 49ers. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm going to say the season's a wash. Yeah. Just going to put it out there right now. Then you had, the speaking of those commanders, uh, bum, you, bum, 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 bum. you had the commanders defeat the Denver Broncos in the wildest finish I've seen in some time, 35-33. to 33. Yeah, that was the only thing exciting about this game. Cause, hey, hey, commanders, knock it down. Don't yes. try and catch this shit. Why would you try and catch that? That's something they teach you in Pee Wee football. Uh-huh. I don't, I don't get why in the pro level this happens more times than not. Yeah. But somehow, someway, the Broncos... Tie it. 
Yeah. Or they, you know, at least they got that touchdown. They, but they, they got it within two. Right. And but then they, they needed the two point convert. So they had the Hail Mary time expired. You know, it got tipped. I want to say two or three times. Mm-hmm. And then, the, then they came down with it. So Holy shit. Like I'm like, he Russell chucked it up and I screamed, knock it down, mm-hmm. you know, but then they didn't, they stupidly tried to catch it tip tip. And then it got caught. I'm like, Holy shit. So then they needed the two point conversion, but it failed. Yeah. Let's ride. Not so much. Yeah, not so much. Uh, then we got to mention because uh, with our uh, – we'll get to the Monday night game. Uh, got a couple Monday night games before we get to our teams. Mm-hmm. Uh, you had the New Orleans Saints win by the final score of 20-17. to Ugly game. <laughs> oh, my God. Absolutely ugly game. Yeah. I mean, I don't even it, – it pains me to talk about it other than Chris Olave. Uh, six catches, 86 yards. Mm-hmm. Like I said, he had great catch. Other than that, this was a completely ugly game. I mean, decent stat line from Carr, 228, uh, no touchdowns, one interception. Yeah. Not bad. Not bad, but... Mike, Michael Thomas showed up. Yeah, that that's noteworthy, I guess. Seven catches, 55 yards. Which, yeah. hey, doesn't seem like much for him, but these days, it's a lot. Oh, it is a lot. He's. I mean, you have to think about it. The Drew Brees era is gone from New Orleans. Yep. They don't really have a lot of playmakers except Olave. Yeah. That's the only one on, that I'm really saying like is a game changer. I think he's got the potential to be. And on and, and 86 yards, there's nothing to sneeze about. No. But then again, you're facing Carolina who... Listen, we all know it's rebuilding, and you're rebuilding in the worst division in the NFL. So, I mean, yeah, there's that. I'm yeah. so, like, I'm even trying to find something nice to say, and I can't. So let's yeah. just say New Orleans, congratulations. Then you had on the other Monday Night Football game, the Pittsburgh Steelers defeat the Cleveland Browns by the final score of 26-22. to 22. Brutal injury to Nick Chubb. Uh, nastiest injury I've seen in a while. Yeah, no, so definitely keeping positive energy for him. Uh, like I say, once he got hurt, and if you have not seen the video, I recommend don't watch it. Yeah, no, I wouldn't. No, it's 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 very gruesome what happened to his knee. Uh, once he went down, the Browns were trying to regain composure and mm-hmm. try finding their offensive ways, but Pittsburgh... It's tough at home to begin with, let alone their rivalry since the dawn of time, it feels like. Mm-hmm. So they were definitely going to step up for this. And, I mean, it was a very, very solid back and forth with this team. Yeah. Um, Kenny Pickett did not look the worst. Yeah. So, I mean, twenty, you know, 222, 1-1. One and one, Not the worst stat line for him, George Pickett. Um, he looked great. Pickens, yeah. Pickens, um, sorry, excuse me, uh, four catches, 127 yards, and one touchdown. Nothing mm-hmm. too bad there. And, I mean, on the flip side, Deshaun Watson, the only thing that would be concerning me as a Browns fan right now is you're paying him that much money, and he still looks like he's struggling. Uh-huh. Very, very badly. Yeah. And I understand the time off, you know, if we say in wrestling terms, ring rust, but I at this stage, I I don't know if I exactly put that here. Yeah. I'm sorry. I just, I, I don't. But the Browns still one and one, so is Pittsburgh, and, uh, you know, we go from there. Yeah, just the Chubb injury sucks. I was trying to dig it up because I saw it come across the floor. It's like a torn MCL, PCL, LCL, and then something else. Uh, it's the exact same knee, though, that he injured during his college years. Yeah. Uh, so that's not a good sign. No, definitely not. No. Uh, then we got to get to our two teams. And let's like last week, we'll start with your team because they were the early team, early game. Uh, you had the Buffalo Bills defeat the Las Vegas Raiders by the final score of 38-10. to 10. Well, a couple of things were going on with this game was watching this with a dog and Rich from 3FN, who is a Raiders fan. And this game, honestly, the Raiders, I don't know what we were getting out of them, Mm -hmm. to be honest with you, because they were mixing their offense up really solid in the beginning. Yeah. And then they kind of went away from it. Yeah. Because when they were kind of doing the fake run, the Bills were biting on the play action all the time. Right. So they were burning them on that end. However, though, the Raiders' defense just stopped doing what they were doing to give Josh Fitz. Maybe their controllers ran out on their batteries. I, it had to be something. Or the batteries ran out on their controllers. Like it, it was weird. I will say, though, and this is me being a Bills fan. Sure. I thought the officiating was very one-sided, uh-huh. in my opinion. Let me see. And, well, there was two calls that happened. One was a pass interference uh-huh. that should not have gone against the Raiders. And there was another one... Um, little like shortly thereafter, and I want to say it was like a, a, a Josh got picked off, but I think they called uh like right. a holder. There was something else they called an issue, and I was like, I don't agree with that. 
Uh, two accepted penalties for 30 yards uh, on the Las Vegas Raiders side. For the Buffalo Bills, four accepted penalties uh, for 30 yards. Uh, and again, I say accepted penalties because obviously you can have penalties in a game and they decline them, and those don't show up in the stat line. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there was a couple there that I thought I would not have called against the Raiders. I think there was a lot. You know, when you're playing physical games, you're going to have this happen. Yeah. I will say there was one bright spot. James Cook. Yeah. 17 carries, 123 yards. So the nationwide drought is over. Yes. Buy your lottery tickets now. But I will say Josh looked better. Yeah. Um, there was a couple passes I thought he should have done in, instead of the uh, Brett Farvesque, uh just throw the ball and see where line winds up. Chuck and pray. Yeah. I mean – in that kind of situation, I think he had uh, Stefan Diggs open one time in the end zone, completely missed him because he was trying to do something too fancy. Right. He looked better than he did week one. I think he settled in. And I think it had a lot to do with the running game getting established. Is mm-hmm. this something that we've talked about many, many times? The defense looked very good. Albeit, though, Josh Jacobs, nine carries, negative two yards. I was surprised that that was the stat at the end of the day. Uh, the, what was the thing I saw? The first time the league rushing leader from – the previous year finished with a negative average Mm -hmm. in a game the following year or something absurd like that. Yeah. So it was a solid game for the bills. Not going to, not going to lie about it. Uh, Like I said, the Raiders just kind of surprised me. I mean, Devontae Adams had a great game, uh, six care or six catches, 84 yards and a touchdown Hunter Renfro getting one pass for 23 yards. Doesn't seem right. No, I was very, very surprised at that stat line. I going back on it. I thought that, Mm -hmm. The Raiders, like I say, they just something looked off on offense. Yeah, and I I can't really put my finger on it. Yeah, it's just they went away from what was working. Yeah, and and, and especially with Josh McDaniels being a former Patriots offensive coordinator, he knows how to beat the Bills. So like, why are we reinventing the wheel? You would think. I mean, that was the the big takeaway I had with it is just their offense got very very predictable. Yeah. But uh, granted, there was a lot of penalties, I thought, in my opinion, mm-hmm. that definitely helped that favor. But I will take the win for the Bills. They look very solid. They got to carry this momentum yeah. next week. Got one more to mention because we almost forgot about it. And I can hear. Oh, Thursday night. I can hear the Philly Nation screaming at me. So don't worry. We're going to take care of you now. Uh, sorry, Tom, from Off the Cuff Gaming. We got you. Uh, the Philadelphia Eagles beat the Minnesota Vikings by the final score of 34 to 28. Uh, Jalen Hurts, 18 to 23 for 193. Uh, one touchdown, one interception. Kirk Cousins, 31 to 44 for 300. 164 yards, four touchdowns, no interceptions. Have a goddamn game, why don't you? Uh, DeAndre Slift led Philly in rushing with 175 yards and one touchdown. Alexander Mattinson led uh, Minnesota in rushing with eight carries, 28 yards, no touchdowns. Justin Jefferson, uh, 11 catches, 159 yards, no touchdowns. Devontae Smith, four catches, 131 yards, no touch. Wow, one touchdown, excuse me. You know, in this game, Minnesota decided to say, L.A. Chargers, how are you playing? I'm going to do that, too. Because <laughs> if you tell me Kirk Cousins is throwing 364, 4-0, and zero, yeah. I'm like, there's no chance he lost this and, game. And you got Justin Jefferson putting up Randy Moss on Thanksgiving numbers. Yeah. But on the flip side, DeAndre Swift, 28 carries, 175 yards, and a touchdown. Yeah. <laughs> and Jalen Hurts, like, listen, he's the real deal, folks. I think we all believe in it. As we should. I mean, I believe in it. I want a fantasy football championship with him. Yeah, I mean. I'm a subscriber. The uncrowned MVP did it again. And granted, Minnesota, we always say, is not exactly a pushover. No. But they're a team that is very inconsistent. And it depends there are on- times that Kirk Cousins is that guy. And then there are times Kirk Cousins isn't that guy. Right. This time it was a mix. No, it was it was a definitely a mixed identity for him. Yeah. But he did well enough to win. It was just that defense let Philly take over late. Well, and it, and it becomes the multi-headed monster of Philly's offense of who the fuck do you cover? Mm-hmm. You've got Devontae Smith and A.J. Brown, who are both fantastic receivers. You've also got Dallas Goder, who can still have a game every now and then. And then, okay, even if you don't focus against that, you've got to worry about DeAndre Swift on the running game. Mm-hmm. It's a nasty punch. It's a nasty one, two, three, four. I mean, they're just so loaded on offense on Philly. Yeah. But they wound up winning a game that was a lot closer than it should have been. But, like I say, when Kirk Cousins shows up, mm-hmm. The Vikings are not that bad. It just depends on if their defense can hang in there. Mm -hmm. But we have one more game to talk about. Yeah, we do. Uh, we got to talk about the Sunday night game, which was my New England Patriots taking on the Miami Dolphins. And you had the Miami Dolphins win by the final score of 24-17. to Tua Tagovailoa, 21-30, 249 yards passing, one touchdown, one interception. 
Mac Jones, 31 of 42 for 231 yards passing, one touchdown, one interception. Uh, Raheem Moster, uh, 18 carries, 121 yards, two touchdowns. Ramondre Stevenson, uh, 15 carries, 50 yards, one touchdown. Jalen Waddell, uh, four catches, 86 yards, no touchdowns. And then Devontae Parker led New England in receiving with six catches, 57 yards, and no touchdowns. So the big thing with this, again, I saw this stat today with Mac. He has got the second fewest amount of time in the pocket to pass mm-hmm. in, in the NFL this year. Yeah. Because, yet again, he has not had his starting offensive line this week. The two guys who were out last week came back, but they were down another different starter this week for their offensive line. So two weeks he still hasn't had the starting offensive line, which isn't ideal. Also not ideal. Can we stop this shit of like, oh, we're going to play comeback kids yeah, and the cardiac kids and we're going to come back from behind? Two weeks now, they've been behind double digits at halftime. Mm-hmm. And, and oh, we got to make the miraculous comeback. So uh, that kind of is annoying the shit out of me. Can we please stop that too? Three, I guess you could say, we're back to this shit where they can't stop the run to save their life. Like I remember the game a couple years ago against Cleveland mm-hmm. where – it was closer than it should have been, but that's because they shut down Cleveland's receiving core, but the Cleveland run game, because it was Chubb, and then I think it might have been Kareem Hunt. Kareem Hunt, I think, was with them. They were running down our throats at will. Mm-hmm. And it's like, what the, you know, what the hell? I mean, I got to give I gotta give kudos to Christian Gonzalez, the rookie cornerback uh, we got out of, I believe, Oregon, who was on Tyreek Hill most of the night with five catches, 40 yards, only one touchdown, which that's a down game for Tyreek Hill. I don't care how you splice that. Mm-hmm. And I re- and I know Tyreek Hill was talking some uh, you-know-what about what the fans in, in New England were saying to him, which, listen, I can think of about a half a dozen cities that would probably say some real, real fans just need to be better about what they're saying. Period. You, you they, know, they don't. They don't have a right to cross a line like it. No, right. But at, at the same token, you know, I'm not going to take my moral compass on what should or shouldn't happen from a person with uh, Tyree Kill's history. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can look it up on your own time. Uh, but no, the thing is, you know, it. I'm tired of the moral victories. You know, it. It's not a bad loss. It, it's oh, they kept it in and oh, they can't came back. They actually pulled off a lateral late in the game. It didn't fucking have it fumbled and returned for a touchdown. Christ. You know, Cole Strange, you know, still somehow got zero catches. <laughs> Wait, where's this? Where's the, Yeah, here's, here's this stat. Zero catches, zero targets, three yards receiving mm. for, for an offensive guard. Like, fucking absurd. That'll be a Je- Jeopardy question someday. Um, but, no, I'm, I'm tired of the moral victories. I'm tired of the, hey, Max improving. Which Don't get me wrong. I'm happy to see Mac improving. You know, it's just I'm tired of, you know, and I realize it's only two games in, but, like, I've got a standard for this team, and it's and it's not – I, I want to see him win a Super Bowl. I don't want to see her say, oh, it's not Super Bowl. but Like, I want to see him win a Super Bowl, but I like to see them win games. You know, when I'm spending three hours of my personal time where I could be doing something else with my girlfriend, watching a movie, going out shopping, or doing something else. Like, if I'm going to spend three hours on a Sunday night, no matter what it is, I want to see him win. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I'm happy to see the improvements from from Mac. You know, Ramondre's had an okay couple of weeks. Ezekiel, not stellar, but like, hey, it's two games in. You know, and, and I think maybe he got a little, uh, he being Mac, got maybe a little too happy and targeted Devontae Parker a little too much, you know, and, and could have spread the ball out more. I mean, listen, Hunter and Gusecki had great games. Six for 52 and one from uh, Henry. Uh, five and 33 for no touchdowns from Gusecki. But, like, you look at Kendrick Bourne, uh, four catches. Juju, five catches. You know, Demario Douglas, uh, two catches. Ramondre Stevenson, three catches. You know, and, uh, Ty Montgomery had no catches, but he got uh, targeted the one time. Like, spread the ball out around a little bit more. I like, I don't know whether it's Bill O'Brien still figuring out, okay, I've got my system. I know what Matt can do, but we're just trying to figure out how to implement it. But something's got to change. No, something definitely has to change, even with the fans, too. Because the conduct at games, period, language and actions. Mm-hmm. I mean, there was unfortunately there was an ugly incident where a man reportedly was killed. Yeah, which I mean, our our, our deepest condolences go out to his fa- his family uh, about that. Just fighting in the stands, like that kind of shit, just needs to stop. Like fans need to be respectful for players, period. Yeah, and be fans, cheer for your team, boo the other ones. But when you start using, you know, very derogatory language there's no place for it period in, in sports yeah anywhere yeah. not even in society either 
But back that, to the – That's why I like those dudes that are on t- TikTok and Instagram that they go to baseball parks and they heckle players. Mm-hmm. But they do it in a fun way. Well, that's the way it they're, should be done. Like they're not saying, oh, you're a bum. It's like – there's one, I think it was with the San Francisco Giants, where they're like, hey, whatever the player's name was, I bet you don't know the difference between there, there, and there. Yeah. Which I'm like, all right, you're heckling him? Yes, but that's funny. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not fighting in the stance over a yeah. fucking game. Yeah. Sorry, excuse my language now. But, you know, that like I say, fans got to be better, period. Yeah. And especially when we talk about it on the field, too. You have to be better playing for New England, and they have to take what they give from Miami. I mean, that's yeah. the biggest thing. Like, Miami is built on a high-powered offense. I'll be though Jalen Waddell, if I'm not mistaken, is in concussion protocol. Or I was hearing something Ooh. about that. I did not hear official confirmation, but I did hear that he did suffer an injury after the game, and he, he was got, well, getting he evaluated. Got, he got whiplashed because mm-hmm. there was one point, I want to say it was – Maybe fourth quarter? Lately, it was the second half where he went up for a catch and he got fucking upended. Yeah. And knocked on his head. Yeah. So oh, I, I, I heard that, and granted, this is rumored because we're trying to get confirmation about it that he was in concussion protocol. For right. It, which, I mean, is an unfortunate thing about football. Mm-hmm. That, especially, too, when you have two teams that are going and playing as hard as these two were, you know, injuries were happening. Injuries are happening all over the league, too, this weekend, yeah. too. It just seemed like a very, very high amount, especially this early in the season. Also, uh, I don't know who is responsible for drawing up the block field goal play the way they did, but kudos to fucking you. That was genius. Mm-hmm. That was incredible. Oh, absolutely. But I, I agree with you. The Patriots are not built to come from behind. And no. Anytime they're in that position. I'm not saying it's an instant W, but you're asking a lot for Mac, who you have two yeah. great tight ends, and that's yeah. it. I, I can understand and I can excuse – you know, coming from behind and falling behind last week mm-hmm. because it was pouring buckets of rain. You know, so I can I can understand that. But this, it was they. There was no rain. There was no wind. There was no other, other than normal wind. There was nothing crazy. Yeah. You know, like Chicago and San Francisco a couple of years ago. You know, there was no snow. There was no hurricane nor'easter or whatever. Like it was just your average night game in September in New England. Mm-hmm. So like, there's no excuse for it. No, absolutely not. So now moving forward, I mean, the Patriots got to take a look at being 0-2 and trying to figure out how to right the the ship um, yeah. back on course. Because it ain't going to get any easier. Uh, they got the Jets uh, coming up this week, then they've got Dallas, the Saints, and then the Raiders. Right. And for Miami, I mean, things are looking great right now. They got the running game going with more cert. I don't know how long that's going to keep up. I mean, he... right now, teams are going to figure that out real quick. Exactly. And then if Waddle's not in the game next week, a lot is going to be asked about Tyreek Hill. But if any team is smart, they take a look at how the Patriots teamed him. Mm-hmm. And if they can copy that team game plan, they're going to slow him down. And then that's going to be a lot for Tua yeah. to go beat somebody. That's why I say shout out Christian Gonzalez because he was on uh, Tyreek for most of that game. Oh, he played phenomenally. Absolutely. Yeah. A lot of great headlines coming out of the NFL this week. So definitely hit us up on that hashtag, hashtag ODPagePod. What is your takeaways from week two in the NFL? Let's talk about it. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Do not adjust your dial, or well, your phone, your watch, or whatever the heck you're using to listen to the awesome podcast you're currently listening to. I am the Duke of Nerds, Tyler Mack, and I am here to tell you that being a nerd can be a bit overwhelming especially after 30. Life moves pretty fast in our nerd culture, and if you don't take the time to notice things, you miss out. That's why I'm here. As your Duke of Nerds, I am charged with educating, enlightening, and entertaining you on all things nerdy. I do it by running the 30 and Nerdy podcast. 30 and Nerdy is a bad cast company production and currently playing wherever you cast your pod. Follow along each episode using the hashtag 30andnerdypod. And check out what all is going on at 30andnerdypodcast.com. Whether it's DC, Marvel, comics, or video games, I have got you covered. So tune in now. Cheers to you, nerds. Coming back for another segment on this edition of the ODPH Podcast. And it's time to talk a little pro wrestling. You smell that? Yes, I do. I think I smell what he's cooking. I think I do, too, because this is coming all the way from Colorado this past weekend, Mm -hmm. where the eyes of pop culture were tuned in for a college football game. Yeah, so you had the massive uh, rivalry game between Colorado State University and Colorado University. Uh, Of course, Dion Prime Time Sanders is the head coach over at Colorado University, uh, doing big things over there, making big waves over there. The eyes of the sporting world were over there. It's, It's a big weekend. You know, when you've got both ESPN's College Game Day 
and Fox's whatever their pregame show is called, Big Noon Kickoff, I think is what it's called, on the same campus in the same weekend. Like, I can't think of the last time that's happened. Mm-hmm. You know, but the, all the dignitaries and all the f- famous folks were there. Uh, you had, uh, what was it, DJ Khaled was there. Mm-hmm. Lil Wayne was there. Yep. Um, Quavo was there. I know, I know, or uh, no, Offset. Offset was there because Offset was getting interviewed on ESPN when you had offsetting penalties. Uh, yeah, it was funny. But also there, uh, one Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Yes. So he came through for the football game, mm-hmm. but before the game happened yeah. was Friday Night SmackDown. Yeah. And it kind of opened up in a bit of surprise. Austin Theory was in the ring. Right. And then all of a sudden you hear some certain music hit. Yep. And that's Pat McAfee. Well, McAfee came out first. Oh, that's right. McAfee came out first, and he's talking to the crowd, and then he gets interrupted by Austin Theory. Austin Theory talking his Mm usual-ish. And then he he insulted the crowd, and he goes, oh, and McAfee brought up, oh, this is the people. This is the people's ring. This is the people's this. And I'm like, "Uh uh-oh, he's he's really leaning into this. Yeah. I had a feeling Rock could show up because, as we'll get to, he was on the Pat McAfee show earlier in the day. Uh, But then, you know, there was the hint, and and Pat kind of paused a little bit, and then you heard, if do you smell what the Rock is cooking? Yeah. So, lo and behold, yeah, we get the rock. Yeah, and sure enough, the whole place erupted. Uh, and to the folks who were saying that they manufactured or messed with the audio for the rock, are no. you fucking nuts? No, one of the biggest stars in pro wrestling history returns. Yeah, it doesn't matter what arena you're in; it's going to explode. Yeah. And that is exactly what happened. That crowd gave Dwayne The Rock Johnson so much love as he came out, surprising everybody in attendance. Mm-hmm. Because, like I say, we hear rumors all the time. Yeah. But to see him come in the ring, had a great uh, promo segment with, with Austin Theory, mm-hmm. which p- proves how much WWE is in love with Theory. Well, and, and the people are like, oh, he's getting buried. Like, he's been in the ring with John Cena. Mm-hmm. He's gotten the rub with The Rock. I want to say, didn't he also do something with both like Stone Cold and or Taker? Like Stone Cold, I think he did. I, he, I'm not sure about Undertaker. Like he's gotten the rubs from like that's three of the biggest names in pro wrestling history from just the last from just from the turn of the century. Mm-hmm. We're not even talking about in all of wrestling history, just from the last 23 years. And you want to sit there and go, oh, he's getting buried? Yeah. No, like that's that's the guys like. Hey, we, we like this kid. Mm-hmm. And especially with the SG or SAG strike and, uh, yeah. you know, that whole yeah. deal going on. The Rock has a lot of free time. Yeah, he does. So is John Cena. Yeah. Which they also had a great moment, too, on SmackDown. Yeah, they did. So the question was kind of buzzing around about The Rock and his comments he made on game day mm-hmm. where he said that WrestleMania 39's main event was a done deal, him versus Roman Reigns. Yeah, so he, he told the story about how Vince and Nick Khan approached him with the idea for having him face Roman at WrestleMania 39 in the main event mm-hmm. and that they got together in Los Angeles. Now, he said this was probably, and if I remember the story correctly, he said this was probably a full year before the event happened. So this wasn't like a last minute thing. Right. So they met, they met up to get together, all three of them in Los Angeles. They had dinner, they had food, they had drinks. They, you know, chatted it up and they, they had a handshake agreement was the story mm-hmm. and that they were going to do this. And then just for whatever reason that they just couldn't figure out how to get from a to B, you know, and how to get the story to deliver in their eyes, it kind of fell apart and it never came to fruition. But from what Dwayne Johnson has said, and I don't think he'd exactly rib us on this one, and I don't think he'd kind of lead us astray on this one. It sounds like it was in the works that it was going to be Roman versus The Rock at WrestleMania last year. Well, you have to put it in a context like this. So they're talking a year out yep. from WrestleMania. So this is around WrestleMania 38 season. Mm-hmm. Who just came back at 38? Uh, Cody Rhodes. Right. And at the time, I'm sure that they did not have it figured out Mm -hmm. that Cody was going to be the guy to go get the belt from Roman. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it was kind of wait and see the reaction, kind of play it by ear. So if you have The Rock, who is a bona fide superstar, yeah, yeah, it's easy money to make. Yeah, It just depends on what you want to do for storyline. And and, I mean, obviously it didn't go through because scheduling conflicts. Well, and I I know Rich brought it up on this week's 607 TWS, but also in the time between this deal was handshake agreement and then it kind of fell apart. Uh, Dwayne got back together with Vin Diesel and patched things up, and he's now going to be in the final two parts or potentially four parts or whatever the hell it ends up being for the Fast and Furious Mm -hmm. franchise. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously it's bigger money to go there. Yeah. And if you can get bigger money, 
go get bigger money. Yeah, can't fault him. Yeah. So with that being said, they didn't do the main event there. And him coming back, I know, kind of sparked the rumor, would you do the main event this year at WrestleMania and rewrite the story? I mean, is it possible? Sure. Uh, But looking it up now, WrestleMania 40 is taking place on uh, a Saturday, April 6th and Sunday, April 7th. So we're, we're here. We're sitting here in September. So you've got October, November, December, January, February, March, April. You've still got basically seven months, six and a half. If you want to get technical before we get to WrestleMania 40. And, and yes, the SAG after strike is still going on and we, we are still pulling for those folks and we're still, pulling, absolutely. We're still pulling for the writers, you know, but, I don't see that strike going on for another six and a half months. Something tells me that in the time in between there, the deal will get done and, you know, things will come to a conclusion on that strike. Mm -hmm. So then all of a sudden you're going to have a boatload of stuff get put back into production because crap, we got deadlines to meet and we got dates to hit for these movies and TV shows. Right. So is it nice to think about? Would it be great to see? Yeah. But I I just don't think it's going to happen because... Listen, The Rock's busy. The whole re- and he even told the story on the Pat McAfee show of what happened the last time he had a wrestling match. Not talking the one he had at WrestleMania 32 mm-hmm. with uh, Eric Rowan, but when he faced John Cena in New York at WrestleMania, whatever the number was, where he had the injury early on, where it was the uh, it was his something with his hip. I forget what it was. Where like he he talks about reaching down. And feeling, oh, okay, because he thought he compound fractured something. Mm-hmm. And, he, and he was like, oh, okay, no, we're good. And then he tore his ab muscle while he was filming Hercules. Yeah. So he told that story, which that's the reason he hasn't wrestled a match since, is because all the insurance companies and all the movie studios are like, yeah, we don't want you to go off doing a wrestling match and ruining our production. Exactly. Like I say, it comes down to making as much money as you can. Mm-hmm. And where are you going to make more money at? Doing a movie or going to do WrestleMania? Movie. Just saying. So it makes a lot more sense doing that. So yeah. I think in that situation, yeah, it plays a part. Yeah. And I think that if he was going to do it, depending on what happens with the strike. I mean, we've heard I've heard so many rumors about when it could potentially end. It right. could it could end tomorrow. Right. According to some sites if you want to believe that nonsense and right. that's strictly rumors. Right. You know, I think it just depends on when he wants to get back in the schedule and then if he does agree to do it, what does that mean long term for WWE? Well, and the other thing too is, and I'm not trying to put it, push any doubt or push any negative stuff on The Rock. I, I respect the hell out of the guy, but let's face it: could he do a situation like he did with Cena, where he went, "Hey, let's do next year's WrestleMania, book it. We're in the main event, once in a lifetime type of deal." With whoever it ends up being, could, could it be Cody? Could it be Roman? Mm-hmm. Could it be Austin Theory? Whoever the hell it is, The Rock could very easily sit there and go, "You know what?" I want to do a wrestling match at WrestleMania 40, 41, 42. Take your pick and go, you know what? And tell his agent and tell the movie studios he typically does work with and go, hey, listen, I know you might want me in this movie, but for that stretch of time, I really want to do one more wrestling match. Don't call. I'm not going to do it. He could very easily do oh, that. Oh, he but, could. But just he he just hasn't gotten there yet. Well, I think it just comes down to what makes the most business sense. Yeah. And if it's not making a lot of money... Yeah, he could do it. Yeah. But I think it also comes down to what WWE wants to do. And granted, we now live in the Endeavor era. This is true. So things that we would normally say mm, might not happen mm-hmm. could 1,000% happen. Because Vince is no longer in percentage control. Right. But if Ari Emanuel and company say, we want The Rock at WrestleMania, mm-hmm. guess what? The uh, Rock's coming. Yeah. Because Ari Emanuel has like 51 or 52 percent control of the company uh that being tko with the u.s so that's ufc and wwe vince has only got like 16 percent mm-hmm. and mark my words right now this is gonna be the most star-studded wrestlemania they've done in years oh yeah if not all time there's enough time you know for them to like really prep this out plan this out and schedule get people scheduled in there yeah well as, especially if they really want to load this up they're going to want to make the biggest record they can mm-hmm. for wrestlemania this year mm-hmm. and and i'll even say right now i would not doubt that it's cody and roman night 1 yeah rock and roman night 2 because i think if you're going to have roman in there it can't the belt can't be on the line no and and it writes itself just because roman's been talking how he's the tribal chief and oh i'm the head of the table i'm the head of the family and, and much like Rich said on 607 DWS, like, oh, you haven't beaten me. And you can even, and I thought of this while I was listening to you guys, you could even have Roman come show up and go, listen, you like to talk how you're the head of the table. You like to talk how you're the head of the family. But hey, listen, 
you haven't beaten me. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I had to help come back and help you win your first Royal Rumble match. Yep. Because that was the 2015 Royal Rumble in Philly Mm -hmm. where he had to help because he attacked, what was it, Big Show and Kane. Yep. You know, so there, there's a story built in. Yeah, and it makes a lot of sense. And I think that the dollar signs are there. Mm-hmm. It just depends on if The Rock wants to do it, which I think he does. Yeah, I, I don't think he'd keep talking about it and keep getting brought up if he didn't want to do it. Well, I think he's smart enough as a businessman that he wants to plant the seeds in there early. Like, yeah. we can make a lot of money if I come back one night. Yeah. He's still the the most popular action hero in all of Hollywood. So yeah. he'll bring in eyes. He'll bring in yeah. fans. It's a must have for Endeavor, so I can't yeah. see how they don't do it. It just has to make sense storyline-wise, mm-hmm. and but they have enough time to play around with it. The biggest holdup is seriously going to be the sag after strike. Yeah, no, well, I, I do. I will say, though, I do like Rich's idea where it was uh, next year's WrestleMania in Wembley. Oh, yeah. no, <laughs> I'll, Trust me, they do that. They're, they'll, they'll set the all-time oh, attendance record, and Lord. you'll see the bodies in the, in the building. Yeah, you will. Trust me. Yeah, you will. But that wasn't the only news that happened this weekend. No. So the other big news uh, is from the AEW side of things where Jade Cargill is no longer with the company. I believe it's her contract expired. Yes. Uh, And now it's being reported by various sites that uh, she is going to, by the end of this week from the sounds of things, sign with WWE and then appear there in some capacity, whether it's main roster, whether it's NXT, who's to say? I mean, could be NXT. Of course, Becky Lynch did go down there and win the NXT Women's Championship from Tiffany Stratton. So, I mean, NXT does uh, peek behind the curtain. NXT does happen tonight as we record. So is it possible that Becky comes out and has a, hey, I'm a Grand Slam champ. I finally won the belt I never got. And then Jade Cargill, whatever her music ends up being, hits and she comes out. Eh, possible. It would have been perfect last night on Monday Night Raw with the Open Challenge. Uh, that Open Challenge could have been better in general. Yeah, no. Well, let's talk about uh, quickly about Jade. How are you feeling about her coming to WWE? I'm excited for her. You know, I haven't seen that much of her work from AEW just because, as I've said before, I'm not the biggest AEW fan. But from what I've heard, she's great in the ring. You know, she's got great mic skills. So it's going to be interesting to see what they do with her. And listen, I'm never against, you know, building up the women's division and kind of deepening it. Mm-hmm. No, Bonafide Superstar is on her way to WWE. This is great for them. And she is going to flourish no matter where she is. The one thing that she has is she's very new to the business. Mm-hmm. She's learning a lot, but she understands about presence and character. And that's something you can't teach. Mm-hmm. And she knows when she is on the mic, when she does an entrance to the ring for a pay-per-view, she understands it has to be a spectacle. It has to be something that will go viral. Like mm-hmm. she understands that side of the business, Yeah, which if you do, especially at, at such a young age, Sky is the limit. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say right now, I think the smart play is for her to go at NXT just for a brief bit. Yeah. Not saying stay there, but I think if they want to do that, especially tonight Mm -hmm. as we record, if she's there and confronts um, Becky Lynch. Yeah. If she confronts her, like I say, it's going to be like box office. You'll see that. You'll see that go viral all over the place. And I think that that's smart for them. But on the flip side, this is a very bad loss for AEW. Yeah, because as I believe it was you pointed out on 607 TWS this week, this is the first homegrown talent loss AEW has had in the quote-unquote war, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. Where, yeah, they lost Cody, but Cody was with WWE before he was with AEW. Right. This is the first one AEW has developed themselves that has left the company. Yeah, no, this is huge. And this is a telling sign of the temp in the room. Now, obviously, if she got a better deal to leave, yeah, that's one thing. But if you're letting your homegrown talent, and what we mean by this is she didn't work in the indies, nope. to our knowledge, or very little if she did. She's literally just been with AEW, and she's made her name in AEW. Mm-hmm. To see a company five years into the game now let somebody go like that, that's a very bad look, mm-hmm. in my opinion. And with a lot of their younger talent, like a Ricky Starks, like an MJF, Mm -hmm. a Wardlow, being free agents in the upcoming year, I think Jade and how she is treated with the company is going to have a lot of sway about what those wrestlers are going to decide to do. So from what it says on her Wikipedia page, uh, it says in April 2019, Cargill attended a WWE tryout at the Performance Center. Subsequently, Cargill uh, began training at AR Fox's WWA4 Academy. Taking advice from Mark Henry, who Cargill described as her mentor, she went to train at Heath Miller and Richard Borger's face-to-face wrestling school. 
She then trained at Nightmare Factory under QT Marshall, Marshall and Dustin Rhodes. Sanjay Dutt and Brian Danielson started coaching her when she they arrived at All Elite Wrestling at the request of AEW founder and owner Tony Khan. Then it goes into All Elite Wrestling. So it does not sound like she did any indie work. Um, also, for what it's worth, and read into this, what you like, she did post something on Twitter uh, just a little bit ago as we record. Quote, ain't no seeing green, but I'm seeing green. Close quote. Oh, I'm sure she got a very nice deal to come to WWE. <laughs> no, no question about that. I'm not saying she got uh, main roster money, right? But I guarantee you, she got she got a very, very nice deal. She got a bag. Yeah. So this is a huge win for WWE. Yeah. I can't wait to see what she does here. Like I say, she has such a bright future, and especially like I say, my thing is I would keep her in NXT. Yeah. Oh yeah. Through SummerSlam. Yeah. Um, or not SummerSlam because I got to remember what time of year we were in uh, Survivor Series. Yeah, Survivor Series, if yeah. not Royal Rumble. Yeah, I can see her. Com- I can see her making an appearance at Royal Rumble. Yeah, but just let her work with the team down there. Ooh, Royal Rumbles in Tampa this year. Tampa not far from Jacksonville. Makes perfect sense. Let her let her debut at the Rumble on the main roster and like yeah. and watch what happens. Yeah, but huge win. Cannot stress this enough. Jade Cargill and WWE, huge win. Yeah, and definitely have to watch how that moves going forward. Mm-hmm. And uh, let's just kind of top it off with Monday Night Raw this past week. Uh, yeah. Lackluster. It was okay. Uh, I was really intrigued by the way they're building the Seth and Shinsuke Nakamura storyline where Seth is becoming slightly crazy yeah. about wanting to get hold of Shinsuke Nakamura where, like, they even brought it up on commentary that they're like, when is the last time you saw the champion chasing the challenger? Mm-hmm. That, like, Shinsuke was supposed to come out and have a match against uh, Ricochet because he attacked Ricochet last week. And then right as... You know, Shinsuke's music was hitting its apex, I guess you could say. You know, Seth's music hit, and he tried to come out and attack him. So I, I like the way they built. They were doing that. That, that was fantastic. Um, you know, the the singles matchup between, what was it? Um, oh, I forget who he faced, but it was one of the guys on Viking Raiders. Oh, Ivar. Ivar. The singles matchup he had, god damn. Yeah, him and Kofi Kingston had the best match. Yeah, him and Kofi had a fantastic match. That was, that was phenomenal. Best match of the night. Um, other than that, I mean, it kind of just... Felt like an okay raw. The open challenge was a letdown, just because it, it's an open challenge. I know there's reports out that Becky wanted Tegan Knox, but that was changed. But like, regardless, I expected a lot more out of that, just because it was an open challenge. And like, I was thinking back to like when John Cena did the open challenge and mm-hmm. Kevin Owens showed up, and I was expecting, you know, maybe maybe somebody from NXT, not Tiffany Stratton, Cora Jade, or yeah, or, no, I, I agree with you, you know, or or. Uh, Gigi Dolan or JC Jane or like somebody from NXT that's in the upper echelon of the women's division mm-hmm. sh- showing up just was like, hey, check us out on Tuesdays, you know, or whatever else. Like, but the fact that it was like Natalia, I was like, oh, really? Okay. No, it definitely was a letdown. I mean, Natalia is great, but yeah, no, but, I got I got nothing against her, but just like, but when, when Becky did oh the open challenge, anybody in the back, and then Natalia's music hit, I went, oh, okay, really? The fact they tried spinning that into a storyline, I just it didn't work for me. No, me it, neither. It is what it is. I hope it's a one and done. Yeah, and we're not moving this forward. Um, I would also say too, the Chad Gable segment was kind of yeah, that one was lackluster. I mean, I don't think he's the guy to beat Gunther. Yeah, but he still elevated his stock tremendously. Yeah. To, to now you're going to have Bronson Reed versus the entire Alpha Academy, it appears. Yeah, no, that's what it looks like. And it looks like we're getting uh, Tommaso Ciampa versus Imperium. Which I'm okay with. I'm all right with this. This is like Tommaso Ciampa when he was chasing Goldie back in NXT days. Yeah. And I'm like, yo, I like this Tommaso. No, no, absolutely. This is what we need. We need we need the ruthless mm-hmm. Tommaso Ciampa. Like, yeah. I, I don't want the the lackey of the Miz. Mm-hmm. You know, like, I'm sorry, that just isn't working for me. Mm-hmm. But the rest of the show was okay. Uh, yeah. The the Jimmy and Jay Uso, who's going to go join the Judgment Day? <sighs> I don't like the direction of that. I think it's going to set up for, I think that's what Survivor Series is going to be. Well, it, I, th- it, I think it's going to be Judgment Day with Jimmy Uso going up against Cody, Sammy, uh, Kevin Owens, Jay Uso. And then pos and then probably Drew McIntyre. Yeah, where Drew turns. Yeah, that that that's where I see this is going. I mean, it could happen. Drew because Drew cause, turning cause it makes sense. Certainly, they're not going to do anything with this for Fastlane, which is the next premium live event for the main roster. Mm-hmm. You know that that's in about two weeks or so. 
you know, so, but that that's kind of my guess is where this is going, that, that you've got now, because now you've got the tag belts actually bouncing back and forth between the shows for the first time in a little while. Mm-hmm. And you've got this kind of whole, all right, who's, who's going to join Judgment Day? What's going to happen and all this? I think that's where it's going. It definitely could be, and, you know, we'll have to keep an eye on it moving forward. But for the first weekend of Endeavor, I think they, they did a lot. Yeah. Uh, they really loaded up Friday night, which is the bigger audience. Yeah. So that Ended makes a lot of sense. Like 2.5 million, I think. Yeah, because now with the NFL being on ABC <laughs> yeah, on Monday and, nights. And especially expanding uh, viewings because there weren't going to be as many multicast showings, I guess you could say, between ABC and, and ESPN. But now with the writer strike and actor strike going on, they need stuff to show on ABC. So they're going to do some more uh, Monday Night Football games on ABC. Yeah, so we'll have to keep our eyes on wrestling moving forward. So definitely hit us up on the hashtag, hashtag ODPHpod. What is your takeaway about The Rock returning to WWE? Question mark. Jade Cargill to WWE? Question mark. And what's your thoughts about this past weekend of uh, WWE programming in general? What you like about SmackDown? What you like about Monday Night Raw? And if you're looking for even more pro wrestling content, make sure you're subscribed to 607TWS, the wrestling show on your favorite podcast provider. And, and after... I almost said Monday night, but no, after AEW Dynamite on Wednesday nights, Nerd Initiative YouTube, Wrestling Night Live, where Rich, myself, Nerd Tween this weekend, possibly Padawan J in the future, mm. will be coming through talking everything in pro wrestling. So you want, definitely want to make sure you hit that subscribe button and don't miss the latest episode when it drops Wednesday night, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Nerd Initiative YouTube. That all said, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hey guys, it's Alan Dunford here from Top Hat Studios, co-writer and co-creator of Pocus Hocus and Grandma Chainsaw, and you guys are listening to the ODPH Podcast. Coming back for the final segment on this edition of the ODPH Podcast. Pad, what you got? Got a couple things to talk about, first of which obviously being local minute. And before we get to the Rumble Pony stuff, we do should mention that hockey season is very quickly approaching. Yes. Here in the 607, Binghamton Black Bears back for another full season here at the Veterans Memorial Arena in the 607. Uh, only 24 days away from the season opener where they are playing the Elmira River Sharks. Uh, that'll be in Elmira. Uh, they have their home opener on Saturday, uh, October 14th at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern. Uh, that'll be at the Visions Veterans Memorial Arena. Uh, so you can go to BinghamTonBlackBears.com for more information or certainly hit them up at the uh, box office down at the arena. Uh, but yeah, only 24 days away from the season opener and 25 days away from the home opener. Hockey season is almost here. Yeah, I can't wait to start talking about that. You know what's not over, though? Baseball season because the Binghamton Rumble Pony is still going strong uh, looking at their games from they had from their last season, uh, last week of the regular season where they were at home playing the Reading Fighting Phils. Uh, they had a game on Tuesday where they they won by the final score of eight to one, came back on Wednesday and lost by the final score of three to one, won on Thursday by the final score of two to one, lost on Friday by the final score of two to one, won on Saturday by the final score of six to nothing, and then they won on Sunday by the final score of three to two. Uh, so now they move on to the first, uh, the uh, best of three game series against the Somerset Patriots, which are the double A affiliate of the New York Yankees. Uh, they've only got one home game for this division series. Uh, that is tonight, uh, sub- uh, September 19th, as we record game time at 6.35 p.m. Eastern. Uh, the next two games are in Somerset, New Jersey, uh, with the second game being being on Thursday, uh, September 21st. That'll be at 6.35 p.m. Eastern. And then they have the other game on Friday, uh, September 22nd. That will be at 6.35 p.m. Eastern. Now what happens after that? We'll have to wait and see. But hey, go Rumble Ponies. It's always good to see them back in the playoffs. Absolutely. Playoff baseball is very, very fun. Mm -hmm. And speaking of playoff baseball, the Major League Baseball playoffs are quickly approaching. Uh, (coughs) Excuse me. Starts on Tuesday, October 3rd, uh, and then runs through at least Saturday, November 4th. Of course, obviously, if necessary and all that. Uh, New York Yankees probably not going to make it, although barring some sort of bizarre batshit crazy uh, run at the end of the season. They're not out of it mathematically. Well, they're out of it mathematically for the division. Uh, mathematically, though, for the wild card, there's still a shot. They need some help, though. Uh, but looking at the standings, you've got the Baltimore Orioles in first place in the American League East who have clinched a spot. You've also got the Tampa Bay Rays who have clinched a spot, which, hey, listen, the 
in other news, water's wet. Tampa Bay made the playoffs. Hey, good for them. But I am happy at least to see the Baltimore Orioles because it's been a hot minute. It's been like six or seven years since the the Orioles made a playoffs. They got a great young team. Would not be surprised to see them make a deep run in the playoffs this year, but we'll see. Their pitching is the only thing that hurts them. Yes, uh, that pitching and especially the bullpen. The bullpen could come back to bite them. Yeah. Uh, over in the American League Central, you've got the Minnesota Twins currently in the, the lead with that division. Our Cleveland Guardians are in second place. Uh, Detroit Tigers are still there, but they're not eliminated yet. Uh, so we'll see what happens. They're probably going to be the Twins. Oh, they got a seven-game lead over first place right now. So we'll see what happens with that. Uh, over in the American League West, the Houston Asterisks are still in first place with the American League. Well, listen, fucking Texas is in second place. Uh, and, but then Seattle's right there with them. There's a one and a half lead game lead between first place and third place. Uh, Houston's in first. Texas is one and a half back. Seattle's one and a half back. Although Texas Rangers pitching is falling apart at like the worst possible time. Yeah. Uh, what was it? Scherzer. Uh, they just added and Scherzer's done for the year with them. So <laughs> he's not pitching. So yikes. See what happens with them uh, over in the National League uh, for the East. You've got the Atlanta Braves who con- clinched another National League East Division Championship, which, hey, again, surprise, surprise. This is like their sixth in a row. Uh, no surprises there. Uh, Philly's still in it. Miami's still in it. Mets still some somehow not only. Mathematically it. still in it. Mathematically, it's a less than a 0.1% chance. So you're telling me there's a chance. Mm-hmm. Uh, but no, they're, they're still in it. Washington is eliminated, however, in the uh, National League Central Division. You've got the Milwaukee Brewers sitting in first place Chicago uh, the rest of the division still in it but I mean listen Milwaukee's got a six game lead over the Chicago Cubs in second place so it's probably going to be the Milwaukee Brewers again unless there's some sort of historic collapse by the Brewers Mm -hmm. Uh, and then in the American League West you've got the Los Angeles Dodgers who have clinched the National League West division title Uh, so again surprise to absolutely no one right Uh, so they are and and then looking at the wild card uh, right now you've got the Tampa Bay Rays who have clinched a playoff uh, playoff berth, uh, leading the American League wild card? Uh, you've got the top three teams, I think it is, uh, make a get mm-hmm. a playoff spot. Uh, so in second place is the Toronto Blue Jays, and then you got the Texas Rangers are there in third place. Seattle Mariners are tied with them though because they both have the exact same record, the exact same win percentage, and then you got to get all that. Yankees right there though, uh, they are We're still in it. They're still in it. They're they're right on the outside looking in. They're six games back, so they need some help. They need Texas to. Further implode. They need some whoever. Listen, right now I'm rooting for two teams: the New York Yankees and whoever beats the Seattle Mariners. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the Yankees are still in it, not out of it yet. Boston's there, seven and a half back. Cleveland's ten and a half back. The, and this is back from the third wild card place. Uh, and then Detroit's twelve games back. Uh, and then over in the National League, you've got the Philadelphia Phillies uh, with the first wild card place. The Arizona Diamondbacks are in the second wild card place. Uh, and then you've got the Cubs and the Reds tied for the third wild card place. Uh, they've got identical win percentages. Uh, then you've got the Marlins, Giants, Padres, Mets, Pirates, and Cardinals. Uh, so we'll, end, we'll see what ends up happening. Playoff baseball, always exciting. You never know what you're going to get. You could get a no-hitter like you saw with Roy Holiday a couple of years ago. You could see an absolute bomb of a home run like Schwarber hit the other day. God damn, that was impressive. Four, mm. 483 feet. Mm-hmm. Jesus, that didn't miss much. Uh, but we'll see what happens. Uh, the Yankees are still in it. We'll see. Yeah, definitely a fun time for baseball. I mean, if the Yankees can somehow pull a miracle out, that proves... If they pull a miracle out and they make it, that might save Boone's job. It might, yeah, but... Cashman? Hmm, probably not. Cashman, no. I mean, I think the Jeter era is just all but ready to start. I could see it. Just putting that out there. Yeah. But, hey, let's go Orioles if we got to choose a team. If, yeah, if I had to, Orioles or because my girlfriend likes the Rays because she likes the animal or Rays. Uh, I, I I do have a promise with my my girlfriend that like if the Rays ever win a World Series, I I will buy her a World Series T shirt. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I you, you promises you, I make to my I, girlfriend. I know. I know. I know. Shout out to Liz. Yeah. I, I understand. I get you, man. Yeah. Uh. So on my end, uh, one little quick thing that's popping up on baseball that's just breaking now is yeah. uh, Shohei Otani is. Oh yeah. Uh, doing elbow surgery, and yep. according to the front page of ESPN.com, uh, quote, his doctor says he expects the Angels two-way star to be available as a hitter yeah. for opening day next season and return to the mound as a pitcher in 2025, unquote. Yeah, and that's if he's lucky for pitching because it's a UCL tear, which is one of the ligaments in your elbow. It's the same elbow he's had UCL surgery on before, at least twice, maybe three times, I forget. Mm-hmm. So it's not ideal for him to have UCL surgery again, 
But no, we'll see him back as a hitter uh, next year. Although where is yet to be seen because he is a free agent at this upcoming off season. Sutton tells me he ain't going back to the Angels. Yeah, just, just I, because it, and it's, and Trout's going to be gauntless, and the Angels fans enjoy the time you had with Mike Trout and Shohei Otani. Mm-hmm. They're both come next spring training. They're both. I'm calling it now. They're both going to be gone. You have wasted the best years of Mike Trout, arguably one of the best players in baseball today. And you wasted the time with a generational talent in Shohei Otani and you got jack all for it. Yeah. It is sad to see, but you know what? They were loyal yeah. to the team. So like I say, with Trout, like I, I can't fault him for staying. No, I can't either. You know what? He did the right thing in my mind because yeah. you know what? He wanted to be loyal to a team and he wanted to get somebody built around him. So yeah. Definitely something to keep an eye on uh, in the postseason. Yeah. But, you know, we still got some baseball left to play. Yep. Uh, very quickly for me, my one shot, there was a UFC title fight this weekend that drew a lot of attention and maybe not for the right reason. Mm-hmm. So on Saturday night, we had a title fight in the UFC between Alexa Grasso and Valentina Shevchenko. Okay. So for the flyweight title. And this one ended in, I am going to say, controversy. Okay. You can't tell me otherwise because it ended in a draw. Hmm. And I know Pad's looking for the scorecard right now. Yeah. But I'm going to say this. As somebody that watched this fight from start to finish, the judges, one judge in particular, messed it up badly at the end because Grasso should have lost this fight. Valentino played great uh albeit though it was a close fight so i can understand that but however the one judge who ruled the fifth round 10-8 in grasso's favor Mm -hmm. egregious yep i got the scorecard pulled up in front of me so uh, i won't name names but i'll just give uh, colors uh the pink judge uh scored the fight 48 47 alexa grasso Gave the first third, first and third rounds to Valentina Shevchenko. Gave the second, fourth, and fifth rounds to Alexa Grasso. Mm-hmm. You have the blue judge who gave the first, third, and fourth rounds to Valentina Shevchenko. And gave the second and fifth rounds to Alexa Grasso. Then you have the white judge who scored the, scored the fight 47-47. Gave the first third and fourth rounds to Valentina Shevchenko and gave the second and fifth rounds to Alexa Grasso with, as you mentioned, that fifth round being the 10, eight. Yeah. And I don't understand that because I, I do agree about the second and fifth round was all Grasso. Mm-hmm. Grasso's striking was great. <clears throat> and in fact, got a knockdown on Shevchenko in the second round. But the argument is Shevchenko implied her wrestling skill and was taking Grasso down at will. The only argument that you have here is Grasso in the fourth did some defending and even took position mm-hmm. and tried getting a submission, I want to say an arm bar, late in the round. Like the, the buzzer went off for the end. Mm-hmm. But she had position at the end. Now, not during the round, right. but at the end. Right. So if the one judge sided and gave round four to Grasso because of that, I don't agree with it, but I understand it. Right. I don't agree with the 10-8. Right. I mean, 10-8, it's not exactly what I would define a a butt kicking or an ass whooping. But, like, it's, okay, one side clearly very and definitively beat the other. Mm Mm-hmm. No, like she clearly won the round, but it was not. It wasn't an ass kicking. No, it definitely wasn't. Like, that was the whole thing. They went back and forth. There were submissions going on. Like, it was a great fight. Don't right. get me wrong. Right. But I literally stood stood there and just was like, wait, what just happened? Because, like, there's no way you should have counted that as as a draw. Like, I'm sorry. The, you, that 10-8 is nonsense. It was a 10-9 straight up. Mm-hmm. Like I say, Shevchenko was defending. Sure, she got position taken on her, and she got knocked down. But it wasn't a like I say, I've seen ten eights before. I've seen ten seven. Sure, sure. That sure as hell wasn't one. So, like I say, I I really struggle with that. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't necessarily know where we go from here. I mean, there's a lot of debate internally, I guess, from um, MMA fans about do you go for the trilogy now? 
<laughs> or do you go and let Grasso fight somebody else and Shevchenko fight somebody else? I say shit, run it a third time because I'm looking at the, I'm looking at Shevchenko's record here. Uh, they have fought each other twice. Uh, Shevchenko lost the first fight that was back in March of uh, this year, where it was a face crank submission in the fourth round at UFC 285. And yeah, this one's a split decision win. Mm-hmm. I say at this point, like. It's not like, oh, this was a definitive conquering, you know, decisive win and and Shevchenko has to work her way back up to face Grasso or vice versa. No, like nobody won. Nobody nobody lost. Mulligan, do it again. Yeah, I'm showing Pat the fifth round right now as we're talking. Yeah. So the fact that it went to draw, I I mean, I hate doing trilogy fights because the last time I think we did one in consecutive order like this Uh was Gray Maynard and Frankie Edgar Uh way back when. Yeah. And granted, that held up the lightweight division for the men's. Yeah. And, I mean, obviously how deep that division is. The flyweight is up there, too, uh, for women. Right. So I I would understand. And, in fact, I would say I lean more towards it. But if they went for a switch, um, I don't really see how you can switch out of this, especially with how fans are reacting about this. Because Grasso is a great fighter, definitely was in this fight. Uh, takedown defense was was bad, was very, very bad. But I think Shevchenko and the and her, the pedigree she has with her record, you have to give her that, unless you bump her up to one thirty five because mm-hmm. Amanda Nunez is no longer there. Yeah, that's true. That's the only that's the only logical thing that you give Shevchenko a title shot up at one thirty five. Mm-hmm. And I'm sorry, like if you don't do that, it's a big fail. So yeah. we'll have to wait and see what happens there with the UFC moving forward. Mm-hmm. So that said, for anything and everything, it is the ODPH. You can find it at odphpodcast.com. That's all the sports talk for this week. So for the one and only Padawan J. Fuck the Astros. I'm your host, Ken M. Thank you as always for listening to the ODPH podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. See you next time. Gotta beat to the punch. Gotta beat to the punch. Cause they can't bring